Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee. Or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Hemp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered. Like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films... Head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to the next reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. Open Hearts is over. Will you come over here and hold me? Open hearts, Andy. Uh, what are we doing right now? How did this movie end up on our on our list? 
I had uh, watched a few Suzanne Beer films recently and was just like, God, she'd be great to talk about. Since we're doing this whole season of films directed by women, I was like, you know, it'd be great to find some uh, films of hers that we can throw in there. And then we saw, you know what? She's worked with Mads Mikkelsen a few times. That would actually make for just a fun little, I mean, it's a short series because they've only worked together twice, but, you know, Mads and Suzanne. Hence, we have this uh, series where we're talking about the two films where these two fine people collaborated. And uh, and this is uh, kicking it off. So really, I mean, if we're telling people the truth, we liked it because of the cute name, Mads and Suzanne. We think it's adorable. It is a cute name, isn't yeah. it? All right. Uh, had you ever seen this movie before? No, I had seen a number of uh, other films, as I said. Um, so I, you know, I was really excited to jump back into this one because she is a storyteller uh, who makes films that have some fairly complex and interesting kind of emotional through lines with the characters. And I really enjoy them. And I should specifically say, I really enjoy her uh, storylines that generally fall with films that she's doing when she's working in her home country, in her home language. Um, I, I haven't seen anything that she's done where she's directed in English, but the generally the consensus is they're not that great. Like she did uh, Things We Lost in the Fire with Halle Berry, which, uh, you know, wasn't rated that well. She did uh, Serena, which was the film with um, Bradley Cooper and Jennifer Lawrence that no one remembers even got made. And then she did Bird Box, which um, I didn't see, but uh, did you see that one? I, I know did. it had a lot of issues, like a lot of people complained about it, but um, what was your thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I, I see it as firmly meh, uh, but I was also probably too big of a fan of the uh, book. Mm. So. But I think firmly meh was kind of a general consensus, so I don't think it's just because you were a fan of the book. Well, I didn't, you know, I, I actually, now that you say that, I didn't really look at the consensus. And so I didn't know that it wasn't just me. I assumed it was just me. But, you know, it was also, it, it was, I can't remember what it came, it came out in, what, 2017, 2018? 18. 18. 18. When did A Quiet Place come out? Probably the same year. I, I want to say I feel like, had to have been I feel close. like they were on top of each other. Yeah. Uh, Quiet Place was also 2018, yeah. And that's the other problem, that that of sensory de deprivation experiences, right? <laughs> the uh, Quiet Place was just vastly better. Yeah. So, okay, good. Well, at least uh, at least I feel like... Do you want to do you want to call uh, what you think I thought of it? I think you like the title, Pete. I think you went into this with an open heart. <laughs> And you came out feeling like you are quadriplegic. <laughs> I don't know. I think um, I, the thing is, I, I think I can. I, I think you think this was a hard movie to watch and you feel like you personally are a better person for having watched it. But I don't know how that translates to a rating for you. I'm leaning toward toward uh, three and a half, four stars. But. I could be, I, I could be just, it could be a shutout. It could be a five star for you. I think you're that, that kind of guy. Guess you'll have to wait and see. All right. Guess you'll have to wait and see. Well, this movie was rated R at the time of its release here in the U.S. And that is for language and sexuality. Hey, you want to watch this movie and help us out? Well, uh, if you see the Apple or an Amazon link to this movie or any other movie in the show notes, just click on it and it will take you right to their site and you can rent or buy the movie. When you do this, we get a little bit of the action. It's nice of them to kind of uh, help us out that way. And, it's, uh, and then you also get to see the movie. So everybody wins. Is the t-shirt for this movie going to be just surgery, just like an open chest? Can we do that? I mean, it's, I know it's not directly related, but I do like the idea of it at truestory.fm slash TNR merch. You may be the only one who wants to wear a shirt with an open heart surgery image on it. Much like I'm the only person who wears a shirt that is stained glass covered in black mold. Apparently, I'm the only one That's of true. those two. That's okay. That's we'll true. always have Spicoli's surf shop. 
<laughs> truestory.fm slash TNR merch shirts, stickers, mugs, masks, pillows and more with anything we've come up with uh, check it out uh, we would love to feature more audio reviews from you our dear listeners just send your audio file to reviews at truestory.fm once you watch the film you just might end up getting showcased on the episode get them in quick we do record about two weeks in advance so uh, just watch that movie as quick as you can Get that file sent to us, and then we'll throw it in the show. Again, it's two reviews at truestory.fm. And if you're wondering where you can find out what movies we're talking about in the coming weeks, head over to our Letterboxd HQ page. That's letterboxd.com slash the next reel. That's where we have all of our lists, our reviews, uh, our upcoming uh, seasons watch list. Really coming down to it, Andy. we got to get on the stick and get our next season published. Yeah, we got to figure that out a little bit. I know. God, it's coming fast and furious. I know. Fa- oh, fast, fast and furious. And fu- nudge, Andy, nudge, wink, wink. stop, you dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're over at Letterboxd. If you fall in love with a place like we have, like we have, uh, you can <laughs> upgrade to a pro or patron membership. Membership. <laughs> Good Lord. Uh, and uh, uh, when you do that at checkout, just use the code next real. And you'll get 20% off, and it works for renewals as well. Just like Letterboxd has their memberships, we do as well. Uh, We use uh, Patreon's memberful platform. It's integrated right into our website. You can visit the site and join uh, the membership at either month to month or at an annual rate. You get all sorts of wonderful things. All of your episodes arrive early in your box before everybody gets them. Uh, we also get uh, give our members all sorts of bonus episodes. We have a monthly member bonus episode. It fills in a gap from a previous series. Members also get to vote on what that episode is going to be. We do a monthly flick chart re-ranking episode. And after each series, we do a an episode called The Retake, where we talk about what we thought about all the films in that series. Just head to truestory.fm slash TNR membership. You can learn more about the membership tiers. The most it'll cost you is $5 per month or $55 per year. Open hearts, Andy. Open hearts. So first question for you. The English title for this is Open Hearts. Yes, it is. The Danish title is Elsker Dig for Evigt. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but that's basically what... Given there are no other Danes here. Hooked on phonics worked for me, Pete. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It translates to Love You Forever. Uh, What are your thoughts on the two titles? I think I like Love You Forever better. Um, I don't don't think I get open hearts. I don't get it Uh, when I I compare it to Love You Forever. I, I don't know why. Uh, I can't rationalize a reason why they would have changed that open heart. I kept thinking, well, I guess I I didn't keep thinking this, but early on when there was a car accident, I was like, oh, he's going to need a heart replacement. And like, it it was one of those, like, you know, that mini driver um, movie where like there's the heart donation. I can't remember who else was in that. Was it Ben Stiller? I don't remember. But (laughs) anyway, there was that movie where like, you know, somebody, somebody's heart gets donated and she ends up falling in love with the, uh, it was with like the recipient. Her, yeah. I can't remember what it was called. It, I, yeah. I just had this as a pick because it was a stupid. <laughs> it was stupid. It was not. It was great. It's a great movie. Don't knock it. All right. Don't you knock it. Anyway, I kept thinking, oh, there's going to be, anyway, I just kept thinking there's a heart replacement somewhere in here because of this accident. Completely didn't happen. So I also was wondering, oh, I wonder why there there was that. And the only thing I can think of, like why they would change it from, from Love You Forever to Open Hearts is because the, the, uh, the song, there was a song that was written by, let's see, the composer for the film was, it was an Indonesian French singer, Angun. Not sure who that is, but apparently quite popular. And one of the songs written for the movie was called Open Your Heart. And it actually was nominated for uh, an award. I'll talk about that later. But anyway, it was a very popular song. And because of that, I'm like, I wonder if just the popularity of that song is the reason that they changed it to Open Hearts for the English version. Just speculation, but... I, I don't know, like, neither title is that strong for me, but I guess I would prefer Love You Forever if I had to pick one. 
Yeah, especially because now all I can sing is Madonna's Open Your Heart, which, as you know, as a child of the 80s, is the canonical version of the song Open Your Heart. <laughs> it is a pretty good one. I all will, right. I will definitely give you that. Okay, so before we get into the film, there is some setup around the making of this film in the form of Dogma 95. Yeah, Dogma 95. Are you uh, familiar with Dogma 95 and all of its uh, bringings? You know, I read something about it uh, some time ago. I did not investigate at all because I found it tiresome. It's a Von Trier thing. And I was like, oh, I'm going to move on. I'm going to go watch <laughs> yeah. something else. And so I feel like we need to do some setup about what this def- what this is. And maybe oh, I would love to review the rules with you. There are rules for sure. The the Dogma 95 Manifesto, Lars von Trier and Thomas Winterberg wrote this manifesto along with something else they call the Vows of Chastity back in 1995. They presented it at a, it wasn't con, it was something else, some other thing in France, but they presented it there. Basically, the idea was that they wanted to, I guess you could not combat necessarily the like what was happening with the studio films, but they said they wanted to, quote, take back power for the directors as artists. And so they created this manifesto and um, it was the idea was to allow for as as studio films were getting bigger and bigger, bigger. They wanted to almost say, you know, they're doing their thing. We want to still allow for a space for for filmmakers that goes back to kind of the roots of this intimate storytelling. And so they're trying to balance things out is really what it was. And yes, it gets lots of flack. But I mean, there have been a lot of films done this way. Here are the rules. Number one, shooting must be done on location. Props and sets must not be brought in. Um, if a particular prop is necessary, a location must be chosen where the prop is to be found. So that's <laughs> the first rule. I hear Transformers is a Dogma 95 movie. Man, they had to search <laughs> high and low for all those robots. <laughs> Luckily, uh, we had finally just discovered Cybertron. That's so. yes, right, right. So uh, number two, the sound must never be produced apart from the images or vice versa. Music must not be used unless it occurs where the scene is being shot. So like if you're shooting there, there if, if there's music, there should be a radio or a band playing in the background exactly. and you're capturing that live audio. Right. So it's very diegetic is yep. the idea. Yep. Number three, the camera must be handheld. Any movement or immobility attained in the hand is permitted. Okay, yeah. that's, you know, no, definitely on. Exciting. Yeah, definitely here. Sure. Yep. N- Number four, the film must be in color. Special lighting is not acceptable. If there is too little light for exposure, the scene must be cut or a single lamp be attached to the camera. A single lamp attached like a flashlight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, or, you know, like those those interview cams yes, where you've got right. the light. And, yeah, I mean, that's kind of, I think, what it is. Yeah, right. Number five, optical work and filters are forbidden. Okay, so you can't you can't have, you know, like composite shots and and things like that. Yeah, exactly. You couldn't have so they don't want you to use like a split diopter like that kind of a thing would be considered optical work. Yeah, right. Right. Because it's it's breaking the sense of what reality is as far as what the camera is capturing. Okay. All right. Number six, the film must not contain superficial action. Murders, weapons, etc. must not occur. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, because you'd really have to do it, I so, suppose. <laughs> so I think I think number six is problematic for this film, which we'll, well, we'll talk get about. to that. We'll uh, get to that. Yeah. OK. Number seven, temporal and geographical <laughs> alienation are forbidden. That is to say the film takes place here and now. OK. <laughs> okay, OK, so we're not doing period pieces. Nope. Number eight, genre movies are not acceptable. Ouch. This is a rough mm. one. OK. Uh, it makes it hard for Transformers. Right, exactly. (laughs) Number nine, the film format must be Academy 35 millimeter. Okay, I have a question about point nine, too. Okay, Okay. number 10, the director must not be credited. What? What? Uh, Come on. That is Lars writ large. Come (laughs) on. And then there's a little bit extra here. 
Quote, furthermore, I swear as a director to refrain from personal taste. I am no longer an artist. I swear to refrain from creating a, quote, work, as I regard the instant as more important than the whole. My supreme goal is to force the truth out of my characters and settings. I swear to do so by all the means available and at the cost of any good taste and any aesthetic considerations. Thus, I make my vow of chastity. <laughs> God, <laughs> Andy, they're just, I think, they're. I hate this so much. I really, oh. I am viscerally moved to to hate when I read these kinds of things. I feel like this is written by a group of people who vastly overthought their their position in the universe, and that it is wildly unnecessary in filmmaking. And I just hate it. I hate it so much. <laughs> I hate it. It's it is not my favorite thing either. I find it pretentious. And, uh, I mean, I appreciate the idea of saying, you know what, let's find a way to not like to come back from all of this craziness that studio films have done. But by doing so, I think that they've also created something that is painful. And, you know, I struggle when I watch some of these movies. Like, I haven't seen many Dogma 95 films. We'll kind of go through the list uh, here in a sec, the official ones, and just see if there are any particular stuff that we've seen that we like. Sometimes they're almost working even harder to try figuring out how they can make it work to follow these rules. Like, like if you look at something like Dancer in the Dark, I felt like they had to go so far to like figure out, okay, how can we make this train passing by with this stuff where they can do this and they can, you know, do this big musical thing. And like, it just is like, uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, and I actually don't even think, I don't know if Dancer in the Dark ended up being officially a dogma film because it, I think that they ended up breaking so many rules, but yeah. it just feels, it, it gets to this point of where it just kind of, you know, becomes nonsense to me. And, you know, I feel like as long as the filmmakers are doing, are telling a good story, I think they're fine. And Thomas Vinterberg, who was part of this, I mean, his first, uh, the the first Dogma 95 film was The Celebration. It was his film, got huge accolades at, at Con, And so I think that started it off well. Of course, Lars von Trier's um, film that he did that same year in 95 wasn't it was the idiots it wasn't received as well and and so i think that there was a lot of like um you know some good some bad but it boiled down to is the film actually any good and that's generally what it still boils down to and if you look at i mean thomas vinterberg has done the hunt with actually with mads mickelson which is a fantastic film it's not a dogma 95 film it's just a great film same thing with another round which he you know just won an oscar for uh, a couple years ago uh, fantastic, fantastic film. And it didn't have to follow all these rules to just be a good film. And I think he was able to kind of get the point across in both films of that return to just kind of a story about, you know, humans and real stories without having to follow all these nonsense rules. Yes, I think the the level of pretension is just it it is too high for their own good. And I just look at the certificate that was like held up in the hand in front of the handheld camera <laughs> on this movie that says this is to confirm that the director of the following motion picture, Elskar Dig for Evigs, has submitted a signed sworn statement to the effect that this motion picture has been produced in compliance with the rules and intentions set forth in the Dogma 95 manifesto. I think I just hate manifestos. Like I hate them so much. <laughs> I'm so programmed to feel like manifestos are just wildly damaging to uh, community and to work and to politics that I just I it triggers every last little thing for me. I hate it, hate it, hate it. So that is what I have gone into this movie uh, feeling. There are actually only 35 official Dogma 95 films, because then what happened is <laughs> yeah. digital filmmaking really kind of uh, took off and and so much digital filmmaking essentially does what dogma does but it makes it look good yeah and so they kind of gave up on the whole thing in 2005 so they they're just like yeah you know what? it's it's just too much work i think that they all realized it too so only 35 official films uh, were released with the official dogma 95 uh manifesto certificate that you see at the start of this film and um as i look at the list i i don't think that i've seen more than um two or three of them i like i i saw i mean obviously this one i saw 
uh, gosh, what Italian for beginners. I think that may be the only other one I've seen. I haven't seen many. Like I, I missed Julian Donkey Boy, Harmony Kareen's film, which I think was I, that might have been the first um, English one, hmm. um, but not many. And I, I missed the Celebration, which is one that I actually do want to see, the Thomas Vinterberg one from um, from ninety five. Where are you at on the Dogma ninety five list? Well, I'm looking, and I I feel like I don't. I feel like I now have seen one. <laughs> well, it's entirely possible. Yeah. It's such a pretentious thing that, yeah, I it's think it's one so of those things that it keeps people away from wanting to look at them sometimes. Well, and it I'm almost not even like, going to hey, say come that. look at this because it's going to be look crappy. What, exactly. And that's one of the things that I, I feel like I need to get out of here. I didn't avoid Dogma 95 films until I saw my first Dogma 95 film and realized what this nonsense was all about. And I'm not I'm certainly not going to be someone who doesn't watch m- movies because of the manifesto, but I'm certainly not going to seek them out. I, I can almost guarantee there will be something else on my watch list that I'd rather watch first. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I, I would only watch them because I've heard the story is actually good. Again, it just boy, it goes down to the story. I'm not going to seek out a Dogma 95 film because it's Dogma, Dogma 95. Right. I just right. want it to be an actual good movie. So Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so back to this film. Um, just to con- say, yes, she did end up breaking a few rules. There was blood used in the car accident scene. It's theater blood. And that was breaking the rule. That wasn't you're not his supposed to head that. blood. <laughs> it was not his head blood. There were also Can some fantasy going sequences. Okay, I'm going to hit you really hard in the head. We just need you to fall down, <laughs> but on your head. Can you? Do, and then lay real still. <laughs> exactly. Sorry. Go ahead. No, and then there were fantasy sequences that uh, we see periodically throughout the film from a few different characters' points of view. Those were shot in Super 8, which is, again, not allowed. Also, they used a thermocam, which was a cool thing to see popping up in this film. And I'm not exactly sure how it really fit into the film largely, but it was a cool thing to use that also wouldn't have been permitted uh, per the rules. But I guess you're allowed to break a few rules because it still was allowed to be certified. What was this actually filmed on? Not the fantasy stuff, but the do you know? Because I know a lot of the like it said Academy 35. But even before that, it says a lot of these were filmed on, uh, you know, DVDR or mini DV. And this very much looked like mini DV to me. I don't think that it had to be filmed in Academy 35. I think it has to be the aspect ratio has to be it has to be um, Academy, Academy 35. 35. So yeah. it has to be the 185 to 1 One eight, yeah. ratio. And so if anything, they would have to, you know, either film it that way or crop it that way to make it look that way. But yeah, it's definitely filmed on some video form. From, I mean, that's exactly how it feels. Because what I was watching on it was looked like it was pillar boxed pretty heavily. Like I, what it was like, it didn't look like Academy 35. That's the thing that was strange to me. Oh, wait, Academy ratio is um, uh, 1.33 to one, I believe, right? Well, now I have to look at it. Academy 35 is 1.375 to one, 22 by 16. Yeah. Yep. So, um, so basically, no mats. It's just the straight, um, the the actual frame of the film, and so they just have to capture the the full thing. So, okay, that's what it projects in, and uh, that's what we saw. So. Well, it's ugly. It's ugly. It, I it gave me a headache. It's terrible. It's just awful. It didn't give me a headache. It's it's just one of those things where it's just it's you know I it's like watching any other film. It's just you know this is how this one's going to have to look like. You know it's it's muddy. I just kept saying to myself, yeah, this stuff just looks muddy. But you know what? I saw this. I saw this the same weekend I watched David Lynch's Inland Empire, <laughs> and let me tell you, that also looks muddy. But <laughs> you're you know, doing this. You to go yourself, into it for the film. Man. <laughs> go into it for the film not because of how it's going to look i I think it can be like if the story is good you enjoy the story i really struggled with the story this story two couples um you know uh one of them about to get married a young couple um the um the young woman is dropping her boyfriend off uh, and he gets out of the car. He's going on a trip. He gets out of the car and he's hit by another car. It is a shocking, uh, a surprising collision. He's found on the street, um, found like they lost him, like he was hit so hard. He was 
knocked to the next block. He, they, they get him to the hospital, and uh, it turns out that one of the doctors in the hospital is the husband of the woman who was driving the car that actually uh, hit him. He is rendered uh, quadriplegic. The rest of the story is about the, the way these couples handle their grief and ultimately uh, fall apart. It really is a story of complex characters in a time of intense emotion because of this incident that happens. There's largely five characters at the core of this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it starts off with this younger couple, newly engaged. Uh, they, you know, he's getting ready to go. I can't remember where, but basically mountain climbing. It's kind of his thing. He's going off with his buddies to go. Yeah. You know, do some do some um, serious like rock climbing stuff, and and he had just proposed to uh, his girlfriend, and now they're a couple. This is um, Cecilia and Joaquim, and they're the younger couple that we have here, and um, and we see you know they're they're living like a younger couple. They you know are just trying to get their lives started. Yeah, and then we have the older couple, that's Niels and Marie. They are married. They have three kids, and um, and we kind of meet them through Marie and their eldest daughter Stina, who um, they are the two who are in the car when Cecilia is saying goodbye to Joaquim. He gets out of the car and immediately gets hit by Marie, who's driving, and Stina, and they're the ones who uh, you're in the car, and we find out that they had been arguing, and Stina had been pushing her mom to go faster, I guess, to get, I, I wasn't exactly sure why, like to get where they're going faster, or whatever. So mom wasn't paying as much attention as she should. So they're carrying some guilt because yes, it was an accident. Yes, he stepped out in front of them to the point where she didn't even see him. She only heard the noise. But also, let's just say it was Tina's fault. The whole thing was Tina's fault. It's always the kid's well, fault. It's always the, the uh, teenage daughter's yeah. fault. Yep. They're carrying guilt because of this. And then we meet Niels, who works at the hospital, and he's he's there, and he meets um, Cecilia. And yeah, so we have these five characters all carrying different amounts of guilt and complex emotions because, you know, Joaquin wakes up quadriplegic and now has this raging anger, this 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 furious anger burning in him to the point where he pushes everybody away. He's terrible to the nurse that's taking care of him. Um, he doesn't want to see Cecilia and basically kind of keeps trying to push her out of his life. And it's very hurtful. And so it, it creates this this mountain of emotions. He's hurting because he doesn't like what his life, this path his life has taken. I mean, he wakes up quadriplegic. I mean, I would be very upset too. She's, Cecilia's devastated because he doesn't want to be with him. She connects with Niels, who, you know, for all intents and purposes, is only trying to, as a doctor, trying to help, but then ends up having this connection <laughs> to her and actually is even pushed to connecting with her by his own by wife, his Marie, wife. <laughs> who thinks that, yeah, because she's guilty, because she feels guilty that she ran into this guy. And so, like, all of these these five people, like like, come together in this really interesting way that just made for... A lot of bad decisions, a lot of complex emotions, to, and, and like one of my favorite scenes was 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 when Stina shows up at uh, Ce Cecilia's door, berating her for sleeping with her dad, and then breaking down because she feels so guilty that she was the reason behind the accident. And it's like, oh my god, like these people are carrying so much emotion here, and uh, like how how complex and interesting it was because if it wasn't for that accident it would be a straight up uh like soap opera um you know uh just basically another affair story yeah yeah it would and and i uh i i think i just felt like it was another affair story and the problem i have with it and the problem <laughs> i i have with uh, affair stories in in general is that in in and in this case i think it's a it's a great example of everything I hate about these kinds of stories. Like, I really viscerally hate these stories because I, I don't care for, for infidelity stories at all. I, I don't like, I, I just don't like watching them, whether they're good movies or bad movies. I don't, I don't really like them, but I also double down on that rage <laughs> that I feel with these movies when they take four people in this case, like, or more people, because we have Stina involved. They take five people and 
they make all of those people unlikable in their own unique way. Like, the redemption at the end of this movie is not enough to redeem the level of dislike I have for all the characters going through the film, with the exception of maybe the boys, right? <laughs> like the young boys, mad sons. Uh, they, they, I feel like escape, uh, escape some trouble, but everybody else in their own way is a frustrating character. I would even say the doctor. The worst bedside manner doctor ever. And I felt like I already had that in my life. This guy's worse. The guy who had to deliver the news that he was a quadriplegic. He just, he just shouldn't speak. He should not be allowed to be patient front and center. It was just everybody was unlikable. Nobody is redeemed at the end of, at the end of this movie to my watch. And that made it a joyless experience. Even hard stories. Uh, you know, are, are, I think, made better with a, a better sense of redemption. So this was a movie that looked bad and had a bunch of characters that I found I didn't like throughout the duration of the film, only liking them less as we get toward the end of the movie. So is it so are you saying that you find it in, inherently a problem with a film if characters are unlikable? No, I have it a problem. I have a problem with the film if all the characters are unlikable. All the characters are unlikable. There's like, I feel like there's no sense of redemption in the film. I, I don't leave the film having any positive experience with, with anybody in it. So, so you need there to be, um, a sense of redemption. Okay. I feel like you're leading. I feel like you're leading me somewhere. Well, no, I just, and I'm going to, I'm about to be tricked or duped somehow. So let me try and think ahead of you in this <laughs> wicked podcast chess game we're playing. <laughs> no, I just I in in context of stories like this, like I, I feel like what's interesting is that, you know, we're getting these very rich, very real characters that feel like real people who are struggling trying to figure out how to how to navigate this complex situation. And I mean, I don't think the characters are unlikable as, as much as they're very real. And I like these characters, but there are things about these characters that I also am like, gosh, I, you're making decisions and I question the decisions you're making. And so I found it to be a very gratifying take on these characters that I, I found complex and uh, just very interesting in the way that they were making these decisions. And I don't, I mean, I don't necessarily agree with a lot of the decisions made that they're doing throughout the film. I was especially, I, I was cringing when they were furniture shopping. I was like, what are you doing? Oh my yes. God, stop, stop, stop all your head, stop all your head. But he just kept doing it. And they, the, you know, all of this stuff. And, and so I found it to be very, uh, fresh in the in the sense that these characters just felt so real like like they like you know were people that you would run into and and kind of these stories that you would have from people i just i don't know i really enjoyed the level of complexity that we had with the characters here and i i didn't have any issue with the fact that um you know i and like to say that they're unlikable, I, I struggle with that, I guess, because it's like I think I could like all of these characters. Like there's 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 so much to like about them, and yet they're still making bad decisions. And that's what I find so interesting about the film. The story renders them unlikable by nature of putting them in this in this scenario. And this is the problem. I think we've reached the uncanny valley of uh of of uh, relationship drama. And I, I think that's part of the challenge that I have with the film. Like what you call believable, I'm sitting here with my palm on my forehead. Like really, we're going to set this up? Like really, like these two couples are going to be entwined this way? Really? Like I just, I never found it that believable. Like I, I found that, and I'm sure that there are stories that are chaos like this. I'm absolutely sure in real life there are chaos uh, stories of relationships and intertwined, like, you'll never believe kind of thing. But sometimes when you see these stories on screen, and this is an example for me, in an effort to be believable, it becomes not believable to me. And I just felt like the, the dramatic pile on was too much. Like by the time Stina ended up at her house following trailing dad, I was like, oh, come on, like, it's just too much melodrama. So I did not find it believable. But but I do to your to your point. 
I like all of these people individually. Like I like the characters and I love the performers and perfor- and and performances. I just felt like it was too much. It was heavy handed too much. Well, see, that's where that's why I was um, because you do like the characters. And before you were saying everybody's unlikable. No, no, no. I'm what I was saying is like you take characters that I like and throw them into this machine and make them all unlikable by their decisions. That's what I said. Like, I like all of these people until they get to this movie and they become unlikable. There is no one in here who is um, redeemed to, um, you know, by the even at the end when they kind of separate and they all go their own way. It feels like I, I never get the sense that anybody is better for the journey. Like there are lessons learned that that they wouldn't necessarily repeat themselves and make these bad decisions. I never got that point. Well, I mean, we have Niels who says, you know, if I knew that this is where it was going to end up, I would have done the same thing. <laughs> I would do it again. Exactly. So he for him, it was this emotional journey that he did end up feeling he needed to go on. And, and you know, and that's what I find interesting. I mean, it puts these characters into this very I mean, it's a very big situation. You know, two families whose lives are completely thrown into a tumult because of this accident that leaves one of the people uh, quadriplegic. Like that's a big thing for all these people to have to deal with. But then it puts them all into this space. And maybe the relationship between um, Niels and his wife had just been uh, kind of floating along, you know, and and that's kind of the sense that I end up getting as his story progresses is that, you know, he didn't necessarily need to uh, meet um, Cecilia. um, But because he did, it put him in this space where he realized, I just, you know, I, I'm not happy with where my life is. And no matter what, I needed to move on. And that's really kind of where he ended up. He just because he finally, you know, as much as, you know, there was this sense at the end that Marie probably would have taken him back. I feel like he was he was at a point where he's just like, I that's not where I need to be anymore. I, I have to move on and figure this thing out for myself. And so I found that to be really interesting, the way that that his character was reshaped by this entire thing that happened. And Cecilia and Joaquim, they kind of end up back together. And I found that uh, an emotional journey for Joaquim in particular, that he really had to go on a very dark, painful ride that... that Probably tortured the nurse more than it tortured him. Well, totally tortured the nurse. She was she was really doing yeoman's work on on that particular oh boy, project. Was she ever, and and was I she do ever. find I find her one of the most interesting characters in here. Right? They actually give her probably more story than she deserves um, as as a, a part of this film. But going into the whole thing where her her son drowned. Ooh, uh, yeah, rough, dark. Like, let's just find. Let's see if we can find darkness around every corner uh, in in this movie. Um, and like sneaking it in uh, in this secondary character was, I thought, an interesting touch. But her, she was written in such a way to handle his incredible grief and negativity, I, I think, in a really interestingly. Like, I I was compelled by her. And I actually, you know, insofar as it was uncomfortable, I found the, like, his performance of the quadriplegic character and his growth one of the most interesting things in the film. That's the part that I really latched on to. And even though I'm never going to watch this film again, like Diving Bell and the Butterfly, which I've already seen probably too, too many times, uh, thanks to this show. Um, I found it incredibly powerful dealing with that level of confrontation. And I wanted more of that. And that probably goes into my feeling uh, around this movie. There is this whole central narrative where they're doing the furniture hunting and all of that stuff that was so cringe that I kept thinking, what's going on? with my man in the hospital. Like, I'm really more interested in his stuff. And uh, I felt like we bounce back to him uh, occasionally, but he's he essentially writes her into another part of the movie for a long period. And, and that meant we focus less on him. And I kind of wanted more of that journey. So I, I know I'm sort of rewriting the movie a little bit. Because, yeah, but, and I- and I think, honestly, we're getting everything from him that we need. Like, I don't think we need any more from Joaquin's story because I feel like it's all there. Like, we get 
his entire thing. And if we're getting more of it, it's just him yelling in, uh, at the nurse. And, yeah, well, and no, being he didn't write a book with his eyebrows, right? Like he's, uh, you're right. he, he didn't, didn't have that much. <laughs> right. So I don't think there was that much more uh, for his story. And so I felt like we got his journey. We, we, I understand what's going on with him and, and everything's there. And so you didn't stop at any point and say like, where's his family in all this? Like, does he have parents? Where are his well, buddies they that it. they were they going to go it. hiking? Nobody else shows up besides her. Well, we don't see that. I don't know. I mean, his parents were in the U S as she says, mm -hmm. they're nowhere close. And so, um, if they do come to visit, you know, we're not seeing it. And uh, again, I don't think that it's relevant to this particular story. Right, like it right. doesn't, it's not in context of what we're getting here. Who cares? I just don't care his reaction with any of them because it's about his relationship with Cecilia. That's what's really going on here is how he's closing people off. And if yes. his family and his friends did show up, he would be closing them off too. So there's really, we're not getting anything else out of his story. Well, I, I, I mean, that this is, the, the point is not, all that stuff that you're saying, which is all right. Like the point is <laughs> my reaction to the movie, I think is telling only in so far as I was more interested in all of those complications and seeing those on screen than I was with what, with what I got. You want it to be the Joaquin story. I want it to be the Joaquin story. Joaquin and Hannah. Yeah. He's like the biggest deal. Like he's the biggest deal in this. This was a major transformational experience for a principal character in this movie who is sidelined and for you it's it's fine because the story is more about the emotional relationship stuff of the affair and for me it was i don't care about your affair i want to know about this this guy whose life has been transformed forever uh, but i for me i like i love the journey that these other characters do have to go on and watching this relationship that Niels forms with Cecilia, which initially is just kind of an emotional connection that she needs because she has no family, as she says. And Niels becomes that that point of that person she can talk to because Joaquim has shut her out. And he feels like like he's kind of thrust into it because of the family guilt that his family has. And so I found that to be kind of interesting. And then, of course, there's this growing connection. And so I don't know. I just I really enjoyed the way that the whole thing unfolded for me and the emotional connection that I had with these characters as they were as they were moving forward through it. So I didn't have the problems you did with with the story. In fact, I really enjoyed these characters and their um, emotional journeys. As a thought experiment, uh, experiment, like the, there is a there is an element here that asks the question, what is the value of the earned relationship credit over time? Right. So we have these two people, Cecilia and Joaquim, and they have not like they're head over heels in love, but they're still a new relationship in the scope of a life. Right. They are not married yet. He's just proposed like everything is very new. And uh, so he's hit and his life is transformed. And. Now I found myself asking who was right. Like she is is saying, you know, I'm here. I'm going to help you. I'm I'm involved in in our relationship together. And he's like trying to kick her out. At what point do they? Is, is she committed to his transformation for life? Right. That that you know they're they're both very very young, and the film sort of asks. At what point do you commit to somebody who's going to need direct care forever? And you're not married yet. You're not his caregiver. And I liked watching that the balance of that question throughout the film. Every time we kind of bounce back to her trying to come back into the into the hospital, um, you know, really pushing back on him, pushing her away. That question, I think, was was really interesting. And and I felt like um uh, was was worth asking in this movie. And, and I did enjoy I enjoyed that so much. Like, you know, at, at what point would, you know, if they're if they've been married for 20 years, it becomes a, an even different question. Right. Because you have a lot of history dragging behind you of, of commitment and something happens like that. And there's there's a diff, maybe a different expectation than if you are brand new relationship. And so um I thought that was interesting for the movie to kind of push those buttons. So that's a good thing. I think that element of stories, I mean, there have been, uh, I'm, I'm, I can't remember what they are at the, off the top of my head, but there have been stories about these relationships that are at a pivotal point where 
they're just about to get divorced or they're just about to break up or or something. They're trying to figure out, like, what are the next steps for a relationship because it's not working? And then tragedy strikes and the person's left in a particular place like they're, you know, a quadriplegic or whatever the case may be. And it it makes for a very interesting story because it's like we were just about to end our relationship. What do we do now? Yeah. Now that uh, do I need to stay around and care for you because I'm the person that happens to be in your life when this happens? Yes. You know, and, and it makes for a very interesting um, story. And I think like, I mean, you look at something like Moonlight Mile, which was a movie that came out that was about, um, I think it was the director's own life story, kind of where he was dating somebody and she was killed. Um, but it was like right around the time where they were just breaking up or something like that. And so it makes for these very complex situations. And same thing here. It's like, and I mean, they weren't trying to break up or anything like that, but still it's like, he's giving me an out, uh, you know, do I stay with him because I love him or do I acknowledge that this is going to change my life drastically too, because now I am a permanent caregiver for this this person who's a quadriplegic and in a wheelchair and is constantly going to be needing attention. All of our money is going to be going into care. All of these thoughts that that inevitably will go through your head. You know, it's like there's a lot to think about and deal with there. So yeah, I think it's it's definitely an interesting thing. And we get a little taste of that at the end when they do come back together and he's released from the hospital and when he's in the wheelchair and they go to the restaurant and they have to have people carry him in because it's down a set of stairs. And so it, it makes for um, a much more interesting and complex life. But clearly, and that's what I found so interesting about Cecilia's character is she needs Niels when she needs him. But as soon as Joachim is what ready to take her back, like she's she wants to be back with him. Like she's never left him. She just needs somebody. And and so she's ready to deal with all the complexity. And that's what I found interesting about her character. And Joachim has the best comic fodder, too. Like you, that restaurant I wrote down, like that restaurant scene when he asks the, the waiter to help <laughs> him take a leak in the bathroom because she can't go into the men's room. I thought that was that's that's great, especially because the waiter who has one of the the uh, heroic un- understated performances finally comes around to if you really need me, I'd be there, man. You know, I'd be there. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was really great. So, you know, high point. That was great. High that was point. great. Absolutely. What do you think of our performances here? Um, obviously, this is the Mads and Suzanne series. So let's start with Mads Mickelson as Niels. Yeah, I mean, you know, he's Mads Mickelson. That's Mads Mickelson, it's right? Mads Mickelson. So where did you first come to Mads? When did he first pop up in your life? Oh, seriously? I don't I don't know. Sadly for me, it was Casino Royale. Like I had not oh, uh, seen, uh, I had not seen any of the other stuff that he'd got major, major talk about uh, before, uh, before that film. And so I, I found it mesmerizing in that film, but I just like, I hadn't seen Pusher or Pusher 2, those two films that he did with um, uh, Nicholas Winding Refn. Um, I hadn't seen either of these films that he had done with um, with Suzanne. So I just kind of missed all of his stuff. And oh, I think he did um, the Antoine Fuqua King Arthur. So I yeah, missed that too. In 2004, so I, right? Yeah. Uh, I did see that, um, but I didn't see it in 2004. So it might have been Casino Royale for you as well then, huh? Uh, well, I certainly didn't see the Danish dub of Monsters, Inc. <laughs> or Cars. <laughs> um, I I think you might be right. I think it was Casino yeah. Royale. That is so strange because it feels like he's been there all along. Yeah. That, when, like when I saw Casino Royale, it felt like an actor who had always been around, but I just hadn't seen anything of his. So um, I, I definitely want to go back and watch the um, Nicholas Winding Refn films. He also did Valhalla Rising yeah. in 09. I did see Clash of the Titans. Um, yeah, you did. I did see A Royal Affair. The Hunt, he is fantastic in The Hunt. If you haven't seen that, I highly recommend it. Um, of course, he does pop up in Doctor Strange and Rogue One. So he's made it big in kind of the American big blockbuster films. Wait a minute. I just need to say that you didn't, note <laughs> the Paul W.S. Anderson Three Musketeers 2011. Oh, yeah. Uh, with Mila Jovovich. He was Rochefort. Right. I right. noticed you I didn't did say that. I was wondering why. Uh, yeah. Why well, you would okay. leave that out. You you keep wondering. I'm going to leave that. <laughs> I uh, think I saw Clash of the Titans and Three Musketeers in a uh, in double feature. 
<laughs> only you, only you. Best day <laughs> but, of my but life. actually, here's the thing, because because then there also, of course, was Hannibal, which he was, you know, uh, right. I think may have been Fantastic. the thing that perhaps more than Casino Royale kind of broke him in. In, with U.S. audiences, mm-hmm. just playing Lecter for, um, I don't remember how many seasons that ran, but um, two, three seasons, something like yeah, that? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think it was I two, want to say three. Or, I think it was three seasons. Yeah. Of, they were not not full seasons. Not big seasons, two, yeah. 2013 to 2015. Yeah. So, uh, but anyway, I mean, he's he has become this, for me, this, like, iconic actor who I just love watching. I think he's a, a mesmerizing actor um, to look at, and he just owns the screen. And you watch something like The Hunt or Another Round, and it's like, oh, clearly this guy knows what he's doing. And here, I mean, he conveys all of the emotions, and that's what I think that he does so well here. And when he's working with Suzanne Beer, like, she makes these stories with these characters that are dealing with big emotional rides. And so I think that that's um, something that he he works at really well in context of this particular film. Did you ever play Death Stranding? I n- never heard of it. It was a it was a PlayStation game, and it starred goodness. It was what's his name? Norman Reedus uh, was the main character, and Mads Mikkelsen played the character Cliff in this video. He did all the motion capture and voice for this particular character, and the game was uh, highly acclaimed and. Involved apparently an extraordinary amount of walking, like you pretty much were these characters just walking around the the place. It was like a it was like the postman, but just on foot. So anyway, I I've heard really good things about it. I just anytime like one of these major uh, actors shows up in uh, you know in these video game properties, I feel like they're, they 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 merit credit too. So Mads Mikkelsen, Leia Seydoux, uh, uh, Mark Qualley, Troy Baker. And Norman Reedus all in that particular game. It was a big game. Big, big game. Interesting. I do remember when I look at the cover for it, I'm like, oh, I do remember that. But I'd never I never played it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, that's Mads. And he, of course, is married to Paprika Steen uh, playing Marie. Uh, she is uh, another Danish actress who's been in a number of these um, Dogma 95 films. She actually was in Festin, um, the the uh, Thomas Vinterberg film, the, the celebration from 98. So she was right at the beginning involved. She, she also was in The Idiots, uh, Lars von Trier's first of these films, plus Mifune's last song. Uh, so she's really no stranger to the style. What did you think of Paprika? I just, I love saying her name, Paprika. I know, I'm listening to you just get every bite out of it. Oh, it's just great. Paprika. So she, uh, what do you think of her as his wife who goes through the, um, she's the one who was driving? I, I don't feel like I really got uh, what she was going for until the the actual breakup uh, sequence. There's a sequence that starts where she, you know, comes, she's confronted with the fact that he says, I, I just, I'm, I need to leave. I'm leaving the family. And... You know, she has that little exchange with Stina where she says, your father's just being an idiot and then comes home and they have their sort of blow up and she goes into the bedroom. And the next morning when he's ready to leave, you know, she's racked with just rage and pushing him away. And yet at the same time, as he's walking out, we see her turn. And performatively, I think it's the best moment in the movie where she turns and starts to beg him not to go. And what I think she is able to do to demonstrate that conflict, I can't, like, there aren't really words to define it for me because it's such an emotional experience, that push-pull, that I hate you, please don't leave me. She just crushes that moment. Uh, For someone who is kind of a sideline character to the to the actual infidelity she ends up owning the story for me she's she was fantastic and um like you may have become my favorite character in the story just because of how interesting it is because you know sometimes i find in these infidelity stories when the the wronged spouse ends up forgiving you know the their their cheating other because you know they can't you let them go or whatever and i'm like it just is so cliche and it's just this sign of weak characters and stuff but she makes it feel so real to the point where you know i do question i'm like god how would i react if that was something going on in my life which it's not but i mean if it was it's like one of those things where it's like how do you 
Like it, it is this very complex thing that you have to negotiate. And I found her negotiation of that, her mental negotiation, fascinating. And I, I just loved her as a character um, watching, like watching things falling apart, trying to figure out how can I still keep this together in some semblance of, of a fashion of what I had. Yeah, I think she was she was a high point. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in in this in this melodrama. And then we have Sonia Richter who plays uh, Cecilia. Yeah, she was cute. You don't have much to say about her. <laughs> I don't you know, I don't have a lot to say about her. I she was I I think you know, she's dealing with uh being in the middle of a lot of stuff, but I also think that the challenge that she has as a performer is that she is in the middle of a lot of stuff and it, it's it's a lot of it's a lot of stuff. You know, I, I think the challenges that I have with her are not challenges that I have with her. They're challenges that I have with my challenge of the melodrama of the story. So, I, you know, I, I, I like her a lot. I haven't seen anything else. I don't think that she has been in. Primarily Danish work, you know, she and this was actually, I think, very early in her career. Stealing Rembrandt, that might have been a little more widely released. I, I remember that kind of coming out and getting some getting some talk. I don't know much else that she has done that I would recognize. Yeah. I mean, do you have are you uh, is your cup runneth over? I think she was fantastic. Like I, I felt like watching this woman try to sort out how to handle this emptiness that she had. Like she had so much love for Joaquim and he completely shuts this door on her. And she's just trying to figure out like, you know, what do I like? How do I go on? She has no parents. She has no family. He was it for her. And now he's shut her out and she's dealing with all, with all these emotions. I thought she conveyed it incredibly well. And I just I really enjoyed her performance here as she's trying to kind of figure out all of this stuff. And I always felt like there was this love that she had for Niels. But I also always felt like she never really stopped with Joaquim. And you certainly get that from Hannah, the nurse, who always is telling uh, Joaquim she's calling every single day. She calls every single day. You know that she's not able to kind of close the door on him, even though he's able to close that door on her. And so I, I don't know. I found her interesting. Did you believe the nurse? At some point, I think the nurse starts lying. I don't think she did. I fluctuated between believing her and not believing her. And I ended up in the space where I was actually believing her. Like I, I, I went the full cycle with my opinion on that. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. All right. Um, I, I did not, I think that shows how cynical I guess I am about the whole thing. But at the end, I really thought that the nurse was just completely lying because she had totally moved on and, and had he never called and asked for her to come back, she would have been fine. I don't know. I, I don't know if she, I, I have a hard time seeing that she would have ever completely been able to close that door. Like if he never had called again, I think there always would have been a place in her heart that um, was waiting still. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. what I found interesting about her. Okay. All right. We already talked about um, Nikolai Lee Kass. He plays Joachim, uh, the quadriplegic. And a powerful performance that he has to give as this person who seems like a great guy and then ha then turns into this hate monger. This is probably where I would be <laughs> if it were me in this situation. <laughs> I would say, screw everybody, get out of my life. My life is over and I'm a miserable mess. Like I, I felt like I bought into everything he did in this story. Yeah. Could have, I, and, and as I am on the record, could have used more. <laughs> He does. He does end up in uh, uh, Suzanne Beer's film Brothers, which comes out a couple years later. Um, that one was remade in English. Um, I don't think the remake was considered that strongly. He also pops up in stuff like you know he did Angels and Demons. Um, uh, he did. I don't. I don't know if there's that much other stuff. Uh, well, one of the film board's favorites, Child Forty Four. He was in that. So <laughs> that's, right. Um, that's right. Yeah. And then very recently, he did Riders of Justice with Mads, uh, which is something that is on my list, and I, I keep hearing great things about it. I just haven't checked it out yet. Interesting. I don't remember him in <laughs> Angels and Demons. Why? Oh, he was the assassin in Angels and Demons. Interesting. Yeah, I generally. Um, you know, those films. I mean, you took kind the, of fell apart you, for me. You you only keep the posters on your walls. Then for why? 
Why do you do that? <laughs> uh, all right. So Suzanne Beer, um, is this, had you seen anything of hers or is this, this is your entry into her filmography? Oh, oh you saw Bird Box, you said. I did. That was it. That was it. And so, yeah. And so I've got a meh and a mmm so far. Did you see the remake of Brothers? No. It was with Tobey Maguire and uh, was it Jake Gyllenhaal um, and Natalie Portman? Nope. Did not see it. You didn't see that one. Oh, my gosh. Andy. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Wait a minute. I have seen Uh, something else. No, I have seen. She directed a music video from my favorite middle school band. That is Alphaville, the video for Summer Rain. And so I have seen that. She was an Alphaville person. I loved Alphaville so much. That's hilarious. Yep. Yep. Okay. Well, you did see that. Uh, are, do you watch any of the TV stuff? Because she did do The Night Manager. That's uh, I've heard we talked about great things about yeah. The Night Manager. I've not watched the whole. Um, we talked thing. about it briefly when we did our um, series on John Le Carre. And his stuff. And it's something that I definitely have on high on my list of things to check out. I just haven't seen it yet. And I haven't seen like she did. She did The Undoing, which was um, the very recent Hugh Grant, Nicole Kidman, HBO miniseries that um, I think David, David E. Kelly was behind. That got a lot of good buzz. And then The First Lady, uh, which I haven't seen. That, Which I, I've seen, I've seen a lot of the press, uh, Michelle Fiverr, Viola Davis, Jillian Anderson, they're all com- coming around doing a lot of press for this thing. And um, it, it looks really interesting, but no, I haven't seen any of it either. I feel like um, when you look at Suzanne Beer's work and, and the kind of the emotions that she likes, the real kind of characters and everything, I feel like it's going to be like Open Hearts Brothers after the wedding in a better world, like those films that she did. Uh, I mean, in a better world, if you haven't seen that, definitely check that out. It is just a fantastic film, but then it seems like the TV stuff, that's more kind of where you're going to want to jump into for more of the stuff that she does, because uh, I don't know the things we lost in the fire. I mean, surprisingly it's a 7.1 on IMDb, but I heard, uh, you know, nothing but um, how junky it was when mm-hmm. um when it came out so i don't know i mean maybe i want to check it out now that it's 7.1 on imdb but yeah i mean when you um, look at open hearts it's a 7.5 on imdb that is counter to my rating counter to yours <laughs> but uh... <laughs> <laughs> there aren't enough stars for you <laughs> that's right i i i enjoy her i'm very curious to kind of continue checking out her work so Um, definitely somebody that I find interesting. Uh, let's see, what else do we, anything else that we want to talk about? I, I, I have made my airing of grievances complete. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's take a break. Uh, we're going to read the credits and, uh, we'll be back in just a moment. The Next Reel is a production of True Story FM, engineering by Andy Nelson, music by Alex, Karen, Oriel Novella, and Eli Catlin. Andy usually finds all the stats for the awards and numbers at d-numbers.com, boxofficemojo.com, imdb.com, and wikipedia.org. Find the show at truestory.fm. And if your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, please consider doing that for our show. Was there a sequel to this movie that we that maybe would make it better? No sequels, but uh, interestingly, there has been talk of a remake. I mean, Brothers was remade. A lot of complaining was done about the casting. A lot of people said the two actors should have been the two male actors should have swapped parts. There's you know a lot of interesting stuff about that. I haven't seen it, so I'm I'm curious to look at it, but I'll probably wait till I see Suzanne Beers brothers first Mm -hmm. but zach braff apparently is a huge fan of this film uh he has been paying every year to keep the option open on doing an english remake of it i guess he had had it set up at paramount at one point um as the director with him directing it sean penn would have been um starring in the film but i guess with scheduling and budget it still hasn't happened i don't know 
with COVID and everything um, and the way things have shifted, if that still is just something that he's sitting on and, and paying the annual option fee or if he's let it go at this point. But I do think that's interesting that he's so drawn to the story that he's, um, you know, been kind of holding it close as long as he has. Yeah, that is interesting. I would be interested to see his take on it. I, I you know, I'm a I'm what, what am I? I'm a braff head. I don't know. I'm braffy, braffish. I'm braffish. I don't know. I don't consider myself um, braffalicious. <laughs> okay. So. Okay, good. No, you're fine. <laughs> so so I'm okay if he doesn't uh, do this. Although I can't say, you know what? Watching a version that wasn't shot in the Dogma 95 style <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't be a bad thing. Wouldn't be a bad thing. Yeah, That's I right. think that would go a long way. <laughs> it just might. It just might. All right. How to do at award season? Did pretty well for itself. It had 12 wins with 12 other nominations. At the Bodil Awards, which are the Danish Film Critic Awards, it won Best Film. It won uh, Nikolai uh, Lee Kass, won Best Supporting Actor for his part as Joachim. And Paprika Steen won Best Supporting Actress uh, for her part as Marie. Mads was nominated for Best Actor, but lost to Jens Albinus in Atkende Sandheden. And Sonia Richter was all was nominated for Best Actress, but interestingly lost to Paprika Steen in another film that she had <laughs> released this year called OK, uh, which apparently was uh, very good because um, you'll see that pop up again here in a sec. Also, Birta Newman, she was uh, the nurse. She was also nominated for Best Supporting Actress, but she, of course, lost to Paprika in this film. At the Danish Film Awards, which are kind of like the Oscars for for um, uh, Denmark, also called the Roberts, which I think is funny that we have the Oscars and they have the Roberts. <laughs> um, Suzanne Beer won the Audience Award. The film won Best Film. Uh, Nikolai won Best Supporting Actor and Paprika won Best Supporting Actress, stuff we've seen before. Also won Best Editing. Same thing. Mads was nominated for Best Actor, but lost to Jens Albinus. And uh, Sonia was nominated for Best Actress, but again, lost to Pap Paprika in OK. And again, Bertha was nominated for Best Supporting Actress, but lost to Paprika. All the same stuff. The two other awards, it was nominated for Best Director, but lost to Nils Malmros in, for At Kenda San Hayden. That film's popping up again. And The Song, which we talked about earlier, was nominated for Best Song, but it lost to a song by Nikolai Steen for the song in the film OK. So again, we're seeing... <laughs> All oh these gosh. films coming back and, and uh, competing with each other. And then last but not least, at TIFF, uh, the film did win a special mention by the International Film Critics Award. That's for Prescu. We've talked about them before. Suzanne Beer is the one who won this. And what it says is, for the fact that it proves that dogma has come of age and matured into a potent cinematic language that skillfully captures the freeing of real emotions that extreme trauma creates within the lives of the characters in her film. I love that. I know you probably have issues with it, but Beer is the one with the award. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. So I have no room to cast the stones. <laughs> Do you know it would have been better with more robots, Andy? That's what I think. <laughs> How to do at the box office? Did it? Did, I assume, I assume that part of the manifesto is if the film makes any money, you can't keep it. <laughs> or you're not, you're not really a dogma filmmaker. Yeah, you're. Don't forget, we've tricked you into being uncredited, director. You know, I, I honestly have a feeling that this series is going to prove very difficult for me because, you know, we're looking at Denmark uh, and I just don't have the information. It's not as easy to find. I couldn't find budget information for this film anywhere, but I'm just guessing the fact that it is a Dogma 95 film tells me it was fairly low budget. The film was released in Denmark September 6th, 2002, right before it played at TIFF. I couldn't find anything regarding how much it made there. What I could find is this. Open Hearts was critically acclaimed, and with 506,493 admissions, it was remarkably successful with the Danish audience. It's considered her international breakthrough. So with that, I'm assuming it did well. Here in the U.S., the film opened February 21st, 2003, in a limited release opposite Old School, The Life of David Gale, and Gods and Generals. It never played on more than 13 screens, and it never really caught on, only earning 136000 domestically. I did find that it earned 
in total one and a half million internationally. I don't know if that includes Denmark's numbers or not, uh, but from what I have, that is 2.4 million total gross in today's dollars. Again, who knows if that counts as a success or not, as that is all that I have. All right. Well, that's it's probably because the manifesto. You don't have it because they don't have it. It, it doesn't That's exist. Right. Evaporated. Uh, all right. Well, I, you know, I'm not going to say I'm not glad we watched it. Like, I, I'm glad to have this under my belt, if only to have been able to talk more uh, thoroughly about Dogma 95, uh, which is an interesting and kind of ridiculous thing. But it's OK. I can't wait till our Dogma 95 series where we go through all the 37 other films. Let me assure you, you will have a different co-host <laughs> for that. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, we will be right back for our ratings. But first, here's the trailer for next week's movie in our Mads and Suzanne series, the 2006 film they worked on together after the wedding. He wants to shake your hand before he decides to give us the money. It's not possible. I can't leave the kids. This is not up for discussion. Safe, a flat screen, air conditioning. Jacob, welcome. I hate you. I say, yeah, I don't even to see me. Oh, that's fine. I don't even have time to think about it. But come with me tomorrow. And then you have nothing else. I don't know the half of those who come. All right, Andy, how are you going to handle your letterbox? Are you going to go four or full throated five? I have a, <laughs> I like how you don't even consider the half stars anymore. It's like not even a thing. I, I really did enjoy this film a lot more than you did. Um, I, you know, I didn't end up falling completely in love with it, but I definitely enjoyed it. I found these characters very interesting. I'm going to give it four stars and a heart. I, uh, I, you know, I had problems with it. I didn't uh, enjoy my time with it, certainly as much as you did. Uh, but I'm not a, a complete monster. Um, I, it would, I, I, you know, this is, again, where my uh, Pete no five stars or no half stars right uh, comes in to bite me a little bit. Uh, I will give this a two star, but I will not give it a heart. That's cold. Two stars is pretty low. Face is cold. Andy. And no heart. Well, that's going to put the film at three stars and a heart over in our letterboxed. And uh, that's where we're going to end up with this film. So what did you think about Open Hearts or Love You Forever? We want to know. Hop into the Show Talk channel over in Discord, where we will be talking this week about the movie. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. Letterbox giveth, Andrew. As Letterbox always doeth. I went so far down. I went as down as you could go. It is the downiest. Oh. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I did. Um, only because, well, I think it's aspirational. It offers a suggestion for a rewrite that I think would, be, would have made this movie something else. It definitely would not have fit Dogma 95, for sure. But... 
Well, let me just share what Finney has to say with this half-star review. I hate this movie. I hate everyone in this movie except the wife. The last 30 minutes should have been Finn and the daughter teaming up to natural-born killers Mads and the girl. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I'm not surprised you like that, especially because I know you're a fan of natural-born killers. I sure am. (laughs) That says everything. Was that Dogma 95? No, I don't think it was. (laughs) Well, I have a four star by the Hoenn Hippo who has this to say. <laughs> this is shot like a home movie, but Mads Mickelson is in it? <laughs> Dogma 95 is wild. <laughs> look at who look at who Von Trier tricked to be in these movies. Mads <laughs> <Right>. Mickelson. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Thanks, Letterboxd. Andy, it's hard to believe we've been having weekly conversations about movies since 2011. Oh, you're telling me. Producing this show week after week is so much fun, but it does require a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. The Originals page at thenextreel.com slash originals has links to purchase the source material behind our adapted film discussions. Your purchases there help support the show at no extra cost. For the entirety of Season 11, we featured films directed by women. The only exceptions were some of our member bonus episodes. We talked about the lure for our horror debuts series, which is a very loose adaptation of The Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen. Definitely miles from the Disney versions. (laughs) For our 10-year anniversary series, we covered We Need to Talk About Kevin, taken from the Lionel Shriver novel. Man, that was brilliant. And horrifying. Yeah. The Journalist series included Merrily We Go to Hell and The Weight of Water, adapted from Anita Shreve's bestseller. We filled some gaps in previous series with member bonus episodes on adaptations like Malcolm X, Mr. Blandings Builds His Dream House, Cactus Flower, Wild at Heart, Life Force, and the Blues Brothers. Our John Hurd series looked at a trio of adaptations, Chilly Scenes of Winter from the novel by Ann Beatty, Awakenings based on Oliver Sacks' nonfiction book, and Rambling Rose adapted from the Calder Willingham novel. Two films in our coming-of-age debut series were adapted from books, The Virgin Suicides from Jeffrey Eugenides and The Diary of a Teenage Girl, Phoebe Glockner's graphic novel. We had Queen of Katwe for our sports series based on Tim Crothers' nonfiction book, and Clueless kicked off our 90s comedy series, loosely adapted from Jane Austen's Emma. It totally took place in the 90s, though. <laughs> Find all of these books and more adaptations on our Originals page at thenextreel.com slash originals. Start your next read from the movies we've covered. Visit thenextreel.com slash originals today. 